What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and I critically analyze apologists' claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. Tonight, we're going to be taking a look at a live stream that Dr. Sean McDowell did with Dr. Doug Gruthius, which I have to say, that is the funnest name in apologetics right there. Like, next to uh, Sulpicius Severus, um, you know, back in like the 4th or 5th century, century or something like that he's he's a goddamn harry potter villain but dr gruthius tonight is going to be explaining exactly why christianity is not sexist fucking blew my mind that apparently it's not even though i can read the words that are on the fucking page dr gruthius is going to be telling us why we're all wrong and how we're just reading them in the incorrect ways you know literally <laughs> off the page. So if you want to fuck around and find out exactly why Christianity isn't sexist, then please stay tuned. So this is Dr. Doug uh, Gruthius. Well, he goes Doug Gruthius, PhD. So he is a professional apologist. Just so you know who we're talking about here. He has degrees from non-theological colleges but he's primarily trained in the field of theology. And so like, he's got apologetics books, of course, and, and they're like how to like books. It's like how to be an apologist, basically. That's the kind of person we're dealing with here. Obviously, if he's saying that the Bible is not sexist, he's working with a whole fucking different kind of like theology than, than that's uh, presented in the Bible. So we're going to, we're going to figure this shit out. Okay. So, uh, we're about to find out why our shit in the Bible is not sexist. We are going to be going to the pulpit tonight after he says some dumb shit. So hold on to your butts for that. Question number 10 is Christianity sexist. No, it certainly isn't, um, because, again, going back to Genesis, male and female are both created equally in the divine image. Sorry, that was 14 seconds. Yeah, I could have cut it off way before that. 14 seconds. <laughs> so look, the question is right now, in Genesis, does it say that Adam and Eve were created equally? Uh, were they treated equally? Well, you know what? Let's head on over to the pulpit, shall we? So here at the pulpit, we don't bullshit about the Bible. All right. So Genesis 2, 20 to 22, it says God fashions a woman out of, uh, out of one of Adam's ribs. This is necessary since Adam couldn't find a help meet in any of the animals that God made for him. He couldn't successfully fuck and impregnate any of the other animals, so God cloned him but made it a woman so so that it could be a help meet for him, or in this case, she could be a help meet. We all know the story of Adam and Eve in 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 the garden. Um, and what one of the things is that Eve is convinced by the snake to eat the apple or the fruit. And then she convinces Adam to eat the fruit, which there's not really a lot of convincing. It's like, hey, this tastes good. And so Eve, Eve is in the middle of, of this whole thing as being the one that falls first, right? So there's that, which is a little subtle, but in the punishment that God deals out, which is number three right here, it's very obvious that one side is getting the shaft while the other side is getting a little, uh, a little slap on the wrist. Because Eve now... It, God says, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, thy husband shall rule over thee. So God punishes Eve with childbirth, painful childbirth. Now, listen, okay, uh, what he does for the man is that he's got to work and provide food and, and eat and everything in order to survive, right? Like living is basically what he's tasked with is just living as we understand it now. But Eve is, is, is given the sorrow of childbirth. Now I've never been through childbirth, but I can imagine that it's a pretty painful experience. Okay. It's a little painful when I'm on the shitter. Okay. And that's nowhere even close to, to the pain that must be felt, uh, you know, during childbirth. Not only that, but the mortality rate uh, of, of women uh, before modern medicine was bad. Like it was abysmal. And, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, childbirth was a death sentence 
for a woman. With modern medicine, we've been able to alleviate a lot of that. Republicans want to bring it back in full force, though. God is, is basically sentencing all of womankind to potentially die from procreation. And he has the audacity to say, go forth and procreate. I don't know how much more anti-woman you can get, but we're going to find out. So another thing in the, in the old Testament, which we're not even really, I mean, we could spend all, you know, fucking four or five years in the Bible. I mean, on the daily Bible podcast. So God says that the man is going to rule over the woman for one. Another thing is, is that women in the Bible are always presented as being property of men. So to sit there and act like the Bible isn't sexist or misogynistic or anything like that. Uh, I, I feel like that's, uh, it's a, it's, it's a little weird uh, considering this. Okay. Here's another thing that appears like in just the first few second sections of the Bible. This is how it starts off. Okay. And this is where Israel gets established, established. I don't know if y'all know this, but Israel was actually a dude and he was originally named Jacob, uh, until God naked wrestled him in the desert and, uh, Jacob grabbed, was it Jacob that grabbed God's dick or was it God that grabbed Jacob's dick? One of them grabbed the other one's dick and then uh, Jacob got renamed to Israel. I don't know what happened out there to each their own. I'm not kink shaming anything. I'm just saying that's what happened. But it's very important to understand the backstory of Jacob, okay? Jacob was this poor, lowly soul, right? But he had uh, the he had the uts or whatever for uh, Rachel, who was this guy Laban. I think Laban was was the dad's name. Uh, chapter twenty nine of Genesis. Uh, sorry, there's multiple different stories that are exactly the same. Anyways, we're we're at Jacob. He he has the uts for Rachel. Laban is is Rachel's father. Laban decides to sell his daughter to Jacob. And in Israelite society, you sell your daughters into marriage or as many scholars have noted it's sexual slavery in this particular situation the way that women are forced into marriage there's no consent uh, at all considered or anything like that they're just sold off into marriage and so laban wants to swap seven years of jacob's hard labor for his daughter okay but it, it doesn't stop there, okay? Because once he completes his seven years of work, Laban actually gives Leah, Rachel's sister, to Jacob and like a dinner at a fancy restaurant uh, and you don't want to pay for it, Jacob realizes the next morning after he's already bedded Leah that he fucked Leah and not Rachel. And so he's like, well, shit, now I got to work another seven years and buy the other sister. So he worked seven years and he ends up buying Rachel. So now he's got both Rachel and Leah. Oh, but it doesn't stop there because each one of them women have their own women servants. And you're like, oh, servant slavery. Yes, we got all that. Ah, but you for fucking forget that servants are often used as incubation objects. Jacob forced the servant girls to get pregnant when Leah and Rachel couldn't. And then of course, you know, there's there's a whole swapping out of shit that God does with Rachel and Leah being pregnant. In any case, Jacob ends up fucking all four of them. All four of them give birth to kids. This is sexual slavery right here. Of course, the Bible is presenting it as if, as if this was all a choice that was made by the women, but there was no consent that was given. There was no consent that was asked. If you're going to sit there and tell me that the Bible's not sexist, I'm sorry, but I'm not even 30 chapters into fucking Genesis. And Genesis has uh, 38 chapters in it. So it's more than halfway through, but I'm just saying that like just in Genesis alone, you've got some of the most sexist shit playing out. And the rest of the Bible is exactly like this. The rest of the Bible has women being treated as property. Uh, women are given, uh, uh, you know, less of a consideration than a man at one particular point, which I meant to look this up earlier, but at one particular point in the laws, in the Old Testament, women are literally valued less than men. Like, it, monetarily, they're valued less. How is this not sexist? Dr. Doug here is trying to present the Bible as if, oh, God created them, you know, the divine image. They were equally created in his eyes. 
What the fuck are you talking about? Women have to give birth, which at this point in time, like in the Old Testament days, could kill you. You could die. You could die from it now. There are plenty of women who still die, uh, in, even with modern medicine. But Adam, he's just got to fucking farm shit. And, you know, he's got he's to gotta work to provide for himself and his family and all this other stuff. So, I mean, like, yeah, that's exactly equal. Dude's got to work for shit. Woman, uh, she could possibly die, you know, uh, fulfilling her godly duties or whatever. The, the duties that God is said to do, which is to go forth and pro procreate. Like, this is some bullshit. Plus, she got to keep. Oh, and she's got to keep the home and then, you know, she's got to bring her daughters up right so that they don't question things when they get sold to some 45 year old asshole. Anyways. All right, let's get back to the video. Thank you for visiting my pulpit. So now that I've had a little bit of a rant, may maybe we'll go back here in a minute, here in a little bit and, and figure out uh, some more shit. And the creation mandate is given to the first couple. Uh, creation mandate wasn't, uh, now, Eve, make sure to obey Adam and only do what he says. I know. I was like, oh, we'll go back here in a little bit. But um, I just uh, I, I, I had to go back here and check this out real quick because I'm fairly certain. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy co conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband. And he shall rule over thee i'm reading this correctly right he shall rule over thee i mean i'm just checking my eyes here like i get it yeah it, it fucking says he shall rule over thee this is exactly hey woman do what your man say i don't know what in the fuck doug is talking about here I, i've come to the conclusion about something apologists like Sean McDowell here, like Doug, like all of the apologists I feel that take these kinds of positions, they want and need their crowd to be illiterate. Like, I feel like that's what they're banking on. They, they do hate education. The Bible starts out being very anti-knowledge, but it, it just kind of feels like reading the Bible, the words literally on the fucking page here, he shall rule over thee. These people literally want their adherents to be illiterate. How can you seriously read this and be like, oh yeah, that's definitely equality right there. Nobody should believe what in the fuck this dude is saying right now when just being illiterate disproves him. Zachary the Hockey says, oh, and don't forget verse uh, Corinthians 14, 34, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission. That's a really good one too there, Zach, uh, Zachary. Uh, it's It's women should be silent in churches. Uh, they're not allowed to speak and they must be in submission. The whole submission idea in Christianity is prevalent. Again, don't know what the fuck this dude's talking about. And he seems to require his audience to just be fucking illiterate. Oh, I know I can read the words on the page, but my site must be fucked up because it says exactly opposite to what he says. I have to read, he shall rule over thee and think, oh, that means that they are both on an equal footing. No, Doug, fuck. It's uh, given to humanity. And the Bible does speak of appropriate sexual behavior for men and appropriate sexual behavior for women. You know what's really weird about this particular statement, and I know that I'm stopping it a lot, but it's kind of a short clip, is that ap appropriate sexual behavior, that's a, that's a weirdly like subjective statement to make there. Because it's like, well, what's... What's appropriate sexual behavior? Just thinking about it now. Uh, of course, there's like edge cases and, and uh, nuance that should be added. The, the major factor in appropriate sexual behavior for anybody should start with consent. Should it not? Like, I don't care what kinks you're into. You could like suck it on toes while you jump out of a plane or something. I don't, I don't know. I don't consider that to be inappropriate sexual behavior as long as the people involved are consenting to it. Like the mutual consent, informed consent about it. So like, that's the one thing that the Bible does not have in it. So I don't understand how the Bible can have any kind of declaration on appropriate uh, sexual conduct. 
when it doesn't even start with the first step you have to take, and that's consent. The Bible doesn't give a shit about consent as far as women go, uh, or, or you know, the other party or whatever. But it's so weird to hear somebody say that the Bible has this appropriate sense of uh, sexual behavior, but yet it doesn't cover the most basic idea that any subjective standard for sexual behavior should start with, and that's consent. I feel like Doug here is banking on an ignorant or, or idiotic or asinine audience. It does not put a man above a woman or men above women simply because they happen to be men or women. You find many women leaders in the Bible. Yeah, it literally has like a hierarchy like even in the New Testament, it always talks about a hierarchy. Men are on top and women and children are underneath that. And of course, Jesus is first because, you know, the man has to lick Jesus's asshole. And then God is above that, which for some reason they, they separate out Jesus and God, which I know that they think they're three persons in one fucking entity. It just sounds like a crazy person with uh, DID. It just seems so weird for him to say that when it's literally laid out in the Bible, the hierarchy of like the social status of different individuals in society. Women are never at the same level as men or above men. Women are sold into sexual slavery. Men go out and pick their sexual slaves and then pay the fathers so that they can just take the, the, the girl back home with them. And typically these girls are sold by their fathers at a young age, like, you know, 12, 14 years old. I believe uh, it was Rebecca at that, at that well. She was believed to be like between 12 and 14 years old when she was eyeballed by creepy fuck at the watering well. And, and he decided to, you know, go back and buy her. There's never any kind of consideration for whether or not the woman wants any of this to happen. So I'm kind of curious as to the women leaders that he's going to be mentioning here, because I can guarantee you that if, if, if there are women leaders in the Bible, which there are a few uh, that you can consider leaders, it, it's always got a caveat to it. There's always a nuance that needs to be thrown in there to contextualize the story, right? Casey made the, made the distinction that whenever they do the population counts, like in numbers and everything like that, women are not counted, right? Or, or when they list genealogy, Genealogies, genealogies, women are never counted in there. That's why, like in the New Testament, you have the genealogies traced, the, you got the two different ones, and it's all men. It all uh, supposedly leads to Joseph. But New Testament scholars now, because they want you to be fucking illiterate, are trying to say that one of those genealogies is Mary's genealogy which it's not, it literally says that it, they all lead to Joseph. They literally want you to be illiterate. At least their behavior seems to indicate that. Obviously, neither of these guys on the screen here are gonna say, yeah, we want our audience to be illiterate so that they won't know how to read so that we can just tell them whatever the fuck we want to tell them that's in the Bible. They're not gonna be that blatant about it, but the behavior of misreciting just basically lying about what's in the book, I feel requires you to be illiterate or uh, requires you just to not read the book or to be dishonest. One of my favorites is Deborah, who was a prophet and a judge. Okay, Deborah, prophet and a judge. While true, those two things are, are there, Deborah was not solely the judge. Deborah had help, and the, the way that she was validated as being part of that story and being picked as the judge was that she had a man backing her up. She had a male counterpart that validated her being the judge and all this other shit. Is Deborah a, you know, a good example of a woman leader? You could frame it that way, but you do need to contextualize it with only because she had a male counterpart. In the book of Judges, I think she was the, the best of all the judges. I feel like that, that part right there seems like, you know, a very, like he's trying too hard. Like it may, it may be that Deborah is his favorite judge that uh, fine. It just, it seemed like he was just trying a little bit too hard there. I don't know. 
and you find uh, women leaders in the New Testament as well. Sorry, I'll back that up just a little bit there. But like he's sitting there talking about how there's so many women leaders in the Bible. There's so there's so many uh, positive women leads in the Bible. He brings up Deborah, which is apparently his favorite, which is probably why he thought of it. And then he's like, he vaguely mentions in the New Testament how there are leaders. Where exactly? In, in like I'm just kind of curious. Like in the New Testament, who's who's a who's a good woman leader that you know isn't isn't treated you know poorly or isn't treated like you know jewish society treated women which was horribly yes honey there is mary magdalene and and you're right she was a whore i, don't, I can't think of anything that she did necessarily that was like leaderish I mean, didn't they have her find well not find jesus's body at the tomb Depending on the gospel that you read, I do believe Mary Magdalene was was one of them in one of the stories. If we just take that, like the women finding the tomb, that's a good example. If you take the women finding the tomb, in Mark's gospel, they're scared shitless and they run away and they don't say anything to anybody. Portraying the women as, as being these frail uh, and... Uh, women that just, you know, uh, nearly fuck shit up, I guess. But then you fast forward to the other gospels and you have, you know, more uh, post-resurrection appearances. But when they find the tomb empty, they go back and tell the disciples and then the disciples, not believing them, had to go and double check. So it's not like they were they were trusted with anything necessarily it's just that the, the woman told the disciples and then it's like oh well i've got to you know i've got to double check this because you're just fucking women that has problems with it if you want to go back to the old testament if you wanted to pick out another person uh, that could potentially be like a leaderish ruth is often pointed out as being a leader but the story of Ruth, while she does have leadership qualities, it still is very misogynistic and, and, and sexist because basically what happens in Ruth is you've got the, uh, the king there who uh, orders his queen at the time to do some naughty dancing or naked dancing in front of his fellas. And she refuses to do it, so he fires her ass. Okay. And then he sends all of his eunuchs because to be around the king, you got to cut your balls off. He sends all of his eunuchs out to round up a whole lot of young girls so that he can test drive them. If you get my meaning. And he just happened to like Ruth out of all of them. And then there's like this whole thing, you know, that kind of goes on with Ruth and Ruth's uncle and yada, yada, yada. It ends up with the uncle fucked around, found out, and then had Ruth convince the king not to do some really heinous shit. She's still a sexual slave. She's still treated uh, as a second class citizen. She's not, she's definitely not on the same level as, as men. So I, I feel like you could pick any woman in, like presented in the Bible and you can find problematic shit with each one of them. Oh, sorry. That's not Ruth. That's Esther. Yeah. Sorry. I get, I get, uh, characters mixed up. So that was Esther that I just talked about, not Ruth. Well, they're all words on the page. <laughs> but in, in, in any case, I feel like I feel like you could find problematic shit with any woman figure that you find in the Bible. Because like with the story of Ruth, she's still treated like a sexual slave. There's no sex that necessarily goes on in that story that I can remember uh, right off the top of my head, but she's still treated as if she's subservient to uh, the guy. Well, yeah, because she is. That's part of Israelite culture. Israelite culture in the Bible is misogynistic and sexist. So uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says that men are intrinsically better than women or the other way around. Uh, the issue is character. Who are we in our character before God? And if you look at the fruits of the Spirit, you don't have one set of fruit for men, one set of fruit for women. You know, the fruits of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit don't come in pink and blue, so to speak, as my first wife Becky used to say. Well, so he's trying, I feel like what he's trying to do here is to recontextualize how both women and men are seen by speaking from a very New Testament oriented position of like, well, we're all subservient to God. So in that way, we're all on equal footing, right? He did the same thing with how uh, men and women were created in Genesis. Well, we're all made in the image of God. So we're still like, 
you know, on equal footing. And this is a really disingenuous way to frame what happens in the Bible. Because while it's true in the Bible and in the New Testament that you have Paul who says it's there's neither male nor female because we're all subservient to God, we're all children of God, we're, we're all part of this faith where God is at the top and everything else is below that. That particular contextualization of the Christian faith ignores all of the nuance if, you, if you're not looking like from a 30,000 foot view. If you're looking at the the nuance that's intrinsic to the theology of Christianity, it's very obvious that, yes, God definitely places men above women. And women are to be subservient. Women are to be bought and sold as property. No concern is given towards their consent in any situation, not even in the New Testament. He's ignoring all of the context of the Bible and instead wants you to reframe your view of the Bible that includes ignoring reading the words on the page. It requires you to ignore all that nuance. I just can't see myself doing that. I feel like Doug is asking me to remain ignorant on what the Bible literally says and that I need to change the way I view the Bible to view the Bible in the very best light that I can, which includes ignoring parts of the Bible. That just fucking blows my mind that any apologist would think that this would work, which I mean, maybe it shouldn't because uh, it shouldn't blow my mind. That is because it obviously does work. There are plenty of people that believe the bullshit that's being spread by both of these individuals because I know that they're not illiterate. They're foregoing what they can literally read with their own eyes to believe in this weird theology that ignores what's actually in Christianity. So it is by no means sexist in the sense that men are intrinsically superior to women in any way. Now, if you look at science and psychology, are there general general traits that apply to men and women? Sure. There are. But the, there, there is a difference that's made. Like, from the very beginning, there's a distinction that's made. Men have to work in order to eat and live and all this other stuff. That was, that was man's punishment. A little slight slap on the wrist. I, I really need to read this directly from, you know, what it, what it says in Genesis here. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And then here's, here's what it says for Adam, okay? For Adam, he says, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, because you listened to your woman, as <laughs> to, to reframe it, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying thou shalt not eat it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow, oh, well, what sorrow could that be? Does he have to produce a gremlin out of his ass every 10 years? What's gonna happen? In sorrow, shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Women have to push a whole ass person out of their bits down there. I don't know how it fucking works. I mean, it's, it's fucking amazing to me uh, that, 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 that can even happen. W women have to push a whole ass person out of their bits. Men get to have a fucking burrito. How can you sit here on this stream and be like, there's no distinction that's made in the Bible. I'm sorry. I'm a, I must, you know, have some fucking like shit in my eye that's causing words that don't exist on the page to appear there. Because it's very obvious that there are two different things being described here. One, one individual has to push a whole other human being out of themselves. The other person gets to eat a fucking burrito. These are not the same or equal things. Uh, but the issue as we deal with people one on one is who are you, you know, as a man? Who are you as a woman? I'm not going to assume that you're because you're a woman, you're a particular way. Uh, I'm not going to assume if you're a man necessarily you're a particular way. We get to know people and we want to live within the moral standards of Scripture. The moral standards of scripture. Interesting phrase right there. Is it part of the moral standards of scripture to force women into sexual slavery? It, I mean, yes. Yeah, that's the correct. Yeah, it, it is. That's, that's within the moral. Is it within the moral standards of scripture? 
Scripture, mind you, scripture, to sell your daughter into sexual slavery as soon as she can bear children. Whatever moral failings I may have, I feel like I am vastly more moral than the moral structure or moral system of the Bible, because I would not do either of those things. I also wouldn't invade an entire people group, kill everybody in it, and then, except for the virgin girls, and take them as sexual slaves. I am vastly more moral than the God of the Bible, and I don't even have to try that hard. I just got to fucking sit here and be a normal fucking person in society and I'm already, like that, a better person than Yahweh. So don't give me shit about this whole moral system and how in Christianity they care about what kind of person are you. That's another bullshit thing about theology that these guys don't want you to actually think about. They actively want you to stop thinking about this. I, I feel like they have to delude themselves into thinking these things. I do believe that Doug Gruthius here has deluded himself into honesty honestly thinking this shit that he's spouting here. In Protestant evangelical Christianity, the thing that this, these guys are pushing, it doesn't matter what kind of person you are. It really doesn't. It, it doesn't matter to Jesus. And this is a selling point. I didn't think of this until quite recently, just because I, I just didn't, didn't deeply think about it. But this is a selling point of their flavor of Christianity. It literally does not matter your conduct or character, right? It doesn't matter whatsoever because God or Jesus, you know, died for your sins. So all your sins are already forgiven. And if you believe in him, you get into heaven, right? And that's because Jesus masks all of your shittiness because we're all shitty and deserve to go to hell. But it's only through Jesus. Jesus that we're able to get into heaven. That's because Jesus is camouflaged for all that bad shit that you did. So it really doesn't matter if you do bad shit. The only thing that matters is whether or not you believe in Jesus. Now, if you're Catholic, this doesn't exactly track because you can be Catholic, believe in Jesus and still burn in hell uh, because it, the, the Catholicism uh, employs the faith and works. And then of course you have to Ray comforts out there who think that uh, if you're, if you truly believe in Jesus, you just won't do bad shit. Right. And so they, they present this no true Scotsman fallacy for explaining why Christians still do bad shit in the flavor that we're talking about here. The context that we're talking about with these two guys on the screen, they're trying to sell it as well. What really matters is your character, your conduct. Who are you as a person? And I'm trying to tell you, if you look at the theology, and, and I'm not just saying in the Bible, you have to think about how these guys or how Protestants think about salvation. Not necessarily biblical in the sense of just literally reading it on the page because you get conflicting accounts, but it literally doesn't matter if you're a good person. But they're trying to act like that's one of the things that matters. So I don't know if they're just bald faced lying to their audience. I don't know uh, if, if they're deluding themselves into this particular position. Uh, m maybe it's that I, th I would probably lean that direction before I, I lean to the dishonest side of things, but it, it's just, it's amazing to me that they're sitting there and they're, they're saying these things and they're just not even true. That's what really matters. And uh, I've mentioned uh, Becky a few times, my first wife, Rebecca Merrill Grothuis, she wrote, Two books on this, Women Caught in the Conflict and Good News for Women. Now, some Christians will disagree about the role of women in the church, the role of women in the home, uh, but we can all agree that we are equally made in the image and likeness of God and that the Holy Spirit uses men and women in leadership to explain and propound the gospel and do great good works and so see there it is right there he said uh, he, he reinforces this again that if you look too closely and apply and, and consider all the nuance surrounding the actual words in the bible you get conflicting ideas of the roles of each person in christian theology where's women's place at well it's definitely not in the church you know yapping it up and telling people what to think right that's obviously not it at least according to paul and then of course if you look in the old testament women are to be bought bartered and sold off and shit to to creepy old dudes don't look too close at the bible 
You got to reframe it and only focus on the fact that there's God and below God, that's us getting shit on by God and loving it every single day. But the point is, there's no different levels here because God's shit hits every level. Casey said, mm, I'm loving it. <laughs> so, yes. Obviously, if you zoom out and you only see this distinction between God and mortals on earth, and, and the mortals are supposed to be, all mortals are supposed to be subservient to God, you're not going to see the sexism or the misogyny that is, that is inherent to the theology. That's what Doug and Sean here seem to want you to do. Just turn a blind eye to all of the misogynistic and sexist shit. I feel like Doug could have ended this entire thing in a few seconds. He could have just been like, well, as long as you don't read the passages that contain sexism and misogyny, then no, the Bible is not sexist or misogynistic. You have to not read those sections. You have to not consider them. That's, a, that's ex entirely what he said right here. You have to not consider the sexist and misogynistic parts of the Bible in order to come away with this idea that it's not sexist or misogynistic. That's baffling to me. I'm fucking baffled. Do I seem baffled? Because I'm baffled. I'm baffled. <laughs> One of the questions I often raise is if you're going to trust your daughter with any of the great spiritual leaders throughout history, who would you trust your, with your daughter most for a day? Nobody. No, no. I would not trust my daughter with any religious person from the Bible. No. Uh-uh. Now, th there's not one person in the Old Testament that I'd be like, he can babysit. There's nobody. <laughs> there's nobody in the Bible that I think would be a, a good enough to babysit anybody's kid nowadays. I have a 15-year-old daughter, and she's beautiful. Oh, really? I'm glad that he, you know... Uh, he feels that way and he doesn't see any misogyny in his faith. But at the same time, if, if we think about this, what he said, Old Testament figure that you'd leave your daughter with, those guys would have sold their daughters three, four years before that, before they turned 15. At 15, if they're if they're not already married off, I, I, I'm sure the dads are worried. Is my stock spoiling here? Like, what's going on? I need to sell this off. Need to offload the, got to liquidate it. The way that women are treated as property in the Old Testament is just sickening. But Sean here wants us to think about these sex slavers, uh, essentially, in the Old Testament and think about, huh, well, which, which human trafficker would I trust with my daughter? I don't know. <laughs> you know, that guy that bought Esther up, he seems all right. He's a king. Kings don't do bad things, right? Oh, what about David? He's only got 300 concubines. That's a good role model. I want him to look after my 15-year-old daughter. Mohammed? No. Joseph Smith? No. Charles Taze Russell, who founded uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, at least accused of sexual abuse. Buddha abandoned his family. I mean, yeah. Jesus had every opportunity to take advantage of women and still to mm. this day, 2000 years later, passes yeah. the Me Too test with flying mm. colors. I also, uh, maybe I, I, I can agree with him on this. I agree. I would not entrust my daughter's safety to Muhammad, Joseph Smith, the JW fuck or, or even Jesus to be on. Like, I mean, they're going off the idea that Jesus as portrayed in the gospels is the literal Jesus that walked on earth, but he's not, he would have been like in Israelite society. So he would have been just as misogynistic as the rest of the Israelite society was. And I mean, he is, he is a bit misogynistic. Let's see in um, this past week's was it, this, it was either this past week or the week before we covered the story where Jesus basically calls a woman a bitch. She didn't let that affect her and still like had faith in him. And so he, uh, he healed her daughter, but still I, I get that Jesus was maybe not as misogynistic, but you know, the, uh, Jesus also said that, you know, everybody still needs to practice the laws of the Old Testament, the laws of Moses and all this other stuff. And all of those laws are very misogynistic. Well, maybe Jesus wasn't as misogynistic as the rest of Israelite society, 
I mean, by our standards today, he would definitely not pass me too. J Jesus is sitting there thinking that, oh yeah, it's okay to sell your daughters into sexual slavery. Like, that's fine. In fact, if you actually step back and you cock your eye a little bit and you blur your vision, um, it's actually not sexual slavery at all. So it's, you know, it's perfectly fine. It, all that's, you know, decent. It, it, that's great. I don't think that would pass any kind of quote unquote me too test. I would have zero hesitance, my 15 year old daughter, with a single 30 year old man for the day named Jesus because of all the records we had of how he treated women. And if he's a culmination of God, he brings the truth of God's love for men and women all the way to the service. Even though admittedly there's some t pa tough passages we're not talking about here, I think that's the ultimate way to look at it. Sean admits there are tough passages that might throw a wrench in his engine here for this particular thing. But if you just step back, don't consider those shitty passages and only focus on this, you get away with no misogyny. We're not going to handle those horrible passages that talk about selling little girls into slavery or, or killing in, uh, a little girl's entire family and forcing her into sexual slavery. We're not going to talk about those things because we're only having good thoughts, happy thoughts, smile, happy thoughts, because the story of Esther was definitely not a young girl getting kidnapped by a man in power and forcing her to be his sexual slave. No. Doug, did I miss any big questions you get asked that you want to address here? Well, maybe, but I'm, I'm tired, so we can finish now. <laughs> You're tired. Okay. So, <laughs> no, actually, so... I'm fine, but I, I think we had a good, <laughs> a good day's work here. There are lots of issues that, that come up beyond the... 10 that we dealt with, but I think we dealt with 10 of the, the most significant ones. I mean, maybe another one would be, uh, why do you choose Jesus as opposed to Buddha or Muhammad mm. as your religious leader? And I think we've already covered that in terms of mm. the meaning of his death and resurrection. He said that this was a good day's work. That's what he said. I don't consider this a good day's work. This hour that they spent talking about it. And it's not because I, I, I look down on interviews or anything like that. Not at all. It's because of what Sean said right before this last section. And that's there are some problematic things in the Bible, but we're just not going to going to focus on those and we're just going to focus on this happy idea that we have. I feel like for it to be labeled like a good hard day's work, they would have actually handled some of these harder to deal with passages. They would have explained to us why viewing um, sexual slavery uh, to be existing in Israel isn't really a thing. Uh, why is treating women as property to be bought and bartered with why is that not uh, human trafficking? Why is consent not considered it at all in the Bible as far as women go? Why are women literally valued less when they were, uh, you know, um, counting people for taxes? Why are when women have male babies, they are considered less dirty than when they have female babies? That's in the Bible too. I feel like in order to really say that this was a good hard day's work, they would have dealt with those difficult passages, but all they did was hand wave them away and be like, yeah, sure they exist, but you know, we're just going to think happy thoughts today. That's all we're going to do. Think happy thoughts. See this little happy thought tree over here. That's our secret happy thought tree. His miracles, his moral character and so on. But that one often comes up. People will mm. say, there's so many religions. Why Christianity? Why Jesus? Why not Buddha? Why not Muhammad? And uh, I'll talk all day about that. It's not arbitrary. Mm. There are good, sufficient, historical, moral, philosophical reasons to side with Jesus and to make Jesus Lord and to worship Jesus because he is in a category absolutely by himself. No, he's literally not. He's not in a category by himself. He's in a category with other fucks that do the exact same thing for different religions. All of the mystery religions, like the the one that is commonly appealed to is the Isis and Osiris cult. Uh, Osiris, you know, had his whole death and then resurrection in order to accomplish something for his people to give them everlasting life. 
right? There's multiple different gods that offer everlasting life. There's multiple gods that require baptism. There's multiple other gods that have a sacrificial death and then uh, overcoming that death with a resurrection. That he's not in a category on his own. I think it was Irenaeus that said this, um, but uh, basically the early church fathers, uh, when they were ta com talking about Jesus compared to pagan gods, they said that he is exactly like these sons of Zeus that you have. Like they recognize that Jesus offers the exact same shit as these other pagan gods do. And they do the same stuff. He was treated the exact same way, uh, being that went through a passion, died and resurrected. They recognize that these things were, were there. And the early church fathers, you know how they just uh, 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 explained why so many different gods before Jesus do the exact same things as Jesus? It's, it's an age old one. And people think that, you know, it's a joke now, but it's not. The devil did it. Satan himself. I hope you guys enjoyed uh, this video tonight. All in all, I am very unimpressed with this video and the explanation. It would be nice to hear Sean go through some of these harder passages to deal with these uh, passages that are hard to deal with. Uh, it would be great to see how he explains this shit. I think that not going through those uh, was really kind of detrimental for his stream because now walking away from this, I feel like these apologists, they want their audience to be ignorant and illiterate and just gullible as fuck. I think that those are the three things that all apologists want out of their audience. And it seems like they should require this out of their audience in order for them to be believed. Because I don't see how anybody with just fucking eyeballs that work or even fingers that work that can read braille or have a friend that can read the Bible to you word for word. I don't see how anybody just sucking in the information that's straight from the page in some kind of fashion can't see the sexism and the misogyny in the Bible. I don't know how you can walk away from the Bible and not think misogyny and sexism in there. Like it just, it baffles me. I, I feel like this was a bit more detrimental to their case than, than they think it was. Cause obviously they think this was fantastic, right? They thought it was a good, a good answer to that. But I just, I don't see a good answer. I see them telling their audience to forget all the nuance. Don't even think about how so this Israelite society is structured, all the rules surrounding women and men, and even what God literally fucking says in the first few chapters of his holy book. Don't even think about that. I want you to zoom out. 30, a 30,000 foot view to see that God is superior to everybody. So we're all being shat on by God and nobody can escape it. And in that way, we are equal. As long as you don't look too coastly. And that seems to be what they are requiring out of their audience. So anyways, uh, that's going to be it for the main part of the stream tonight. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you will, please go down below and leave me a comment uh, down there. Let me know what you think. Did, did I miss some references or did I get some references wrong? Do you disagree with my interpretation of the sexual slavery that appears in the Old Testament? Anything you want to argue with me on, just go right on down there to the comments and let me know because I'd really love to hear it. While you're down there, why don't you smash that like button because if you're still here after everything, leave, uh, make sure you leave a like. Also, subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens.